Good morning, church. My name is Jason. It's great to be with you guys. Can we stand to our feet as we do? I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into worship this morning. God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be here in your presence together as the body of Christ. We just thank you for all that you do for us. Father, I thank you for protecting us, providing for us. God, I pray that you would be glorified in all that we say and do and think this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing, church.
knows what living is Who's acquainted with our grief Men of sorrow, sign of suffering Oh, blood and tears How can it be That there's a God who weeps There's a God who bleeds Oh, praise the
There's a God who leads. There's a God who leads. Oh, praise the one who leads for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Hallelujah to the Son.
person in this room, whatever they're battling with, that they would just rely on you, Lord, and they would speak your name. And know that that's all that they need is just to trust in you, Lord. God, we love you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for that, that awesome gift that you give so freely. Jesus, I ask that you would prepare our hearts for the message today, that we would just drink up your spirit. Good morning, New Hope. We are so thankful that you've chosen to join us today. Our mission here is to help people find hope one step at a time. We want to love you where you're at, wherever you are in your faith journey, and help you take your next step. If this is your first time visiting us, we would love to connect with you. Take a moment after service to stop by our guest services desk in the lobby for a small gift and more information about New Hope and our ministries. The annual 127 yard sale is just one month away. Booths will once again be available in our New Hope parking lot, August 1st through 3rd, with all space rental proceeds going directly to supporting our ongoing missions in Uganda, Africa. It's a great way to declutter your house and make a little extra money, all while supporting our mission of sharing the hope of Jesus across the globe. Vendor agreements and registration are now open on our app and at newhopecc.org slash events. At New Hope, we believe that serving others is discipleship in action. God uses it to change others and to change us. With a new ministry year launching in August, we invite you to help us make a meaningful impact by serving with one of our teams. Whether you have a heart for kids, youth, music, hospitality, or caring for others, there's a place for you to get involved and to make a difference. For more information on how to get connected, call our church office or send us a message at info at newhopecc.org. As always, we are so appreciative of your ongoing support for New Hope and our ministries. Your tithes and offerings make it possible for us to continue sharing the gospel here, there, and everywhere. If you'd like to give, you can set up a one-time or recurring gift online or place your offering in the boxes by the doors. Now join us as we dive into the Word of God together. Father, we thank you that your presence is here with us this morning. We thank you that we get to gather together freely. God, I pray for clarity of thought, clarity of words. I pray for wisdom. I pray that we would have a sensitivity to your spirit as you teach us this morning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. 2,300 verses in the Bible talk about money. Now, you'll hear things like this, statistics like this. Jesus preached roughly 15% of his sermons about money. Uh, 11 of his 39 parables that he used were about money. Uh, you'll, you'll read things like, it was his most talked about topic. There's a little bit of truth in those, but it's actually not true. It's like if, if someone were to walk out of here after a year of you know, me preaching and go, 60% of Mike's sermons are about parenting simply because I used a parenting illustration in a message. Jesus wasn't preaching about money. Jesus was using money as an illustration to actually preach the gospel. Why? Because literally from the beginning of things, possessions and money matter to people. That's nothing new. 
There's not some new thing that all of a sudden money matters to people or we care a lot about money. We, we kind of talked about last week how this is like the one thing that we don't really want to talk about in church is money, right? And if it's your first time here, you're going like, oh, yep, they're talking about money. Like, I get it. I get it. But understand this. It's an important thing. We, we talked last week why it's important because it actually reveals our attitude towards God. It reveals our heart, our relationship towards God. We looked at Cain and Abel and how, you know, one brought the best of what they have and the other brought some. And it wasn't the gift that God was disappointed in. As if God needed a single, uh, you know, piece of livestock or some fruit. It was their attitude in which it was brought. There was this possessive nature going on. And so Jesus didn't preach about money. He does a couple of times, but he's not just going, hey, I want to preach about money. I want to preach about money. He's actually preaching about the gospel. He's preaching about the good news. He's preaching about hope. And he's using money as a way to demonstrate how important it is. How we handle money is important for people of faith, especially for North American Christians who struggle with cultural idols like materialism and individualism. Simply put, money is a gospel issue. I want you to go back to your childhood, okay? And some of you, you don't have to think very long, and some of you, you got to think real hard, okay? But I want you to go back to childhood on the playground. And there's these moments on the playground where we decide we're going to play a game, and then teams are picked. You remember these moments? It might have been dodgeball, might have been kickball, might have been basketball, whatever it was. There was going to be sides picked. And so everybody was standing around and, you know, there was always like the captains who they, they, like, they were the best. And they're like, we'll be the captains. We'll pick the teams, you know. And so some captains and like you always knew the first kids that were going to get picked. It was like, well, that, yeah, that's an obvious choice. You know, yeah, that's a good pick. I would have picked him too, okay, but I'm probably next, you know. And then like you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And then some of you know what it's like to be the last pick. Anybody been picked last for something in your life? Yes. I love it. I love the honesty. And guess what? You turned out fine. Who cares about stupid dodgeball anyways? <laughs> but maybe you got picked last for something that mattered to you in adulthood, like a job or a career advancement or whatever it was. We don't love the feeling of being last. And I think a lot of times we kind of treat God that way with our resources, with our time with our energy, but with our money. We go, hey, look, well, this thing really needs my attention. I gotta give the resources of that, and then this, and then this. And then it's like, you know, God's like standing in the corner, kicking the dirt, and we're like, oh, I guess I'll get God. You know, like, it's just kinda how we see it. And I'll remind us, God is less interested in amounts given than the attitude in which we give. He cares more about our heart than our money, as if the God who owns a thousand cattle on a hill needs my money, right? Because it's not about the money. It's not about the money. In fact, Jesus demonstrates this in one of his sermons on money. He actually demonstrates this in Luke chapter 20. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus is teaching in the temple. In fact, his regular rhythm at this point was every day he was teaching in the temple, every day. Usually in the morning, he would teach in the temple, and then it says every day in the evening, he went up to the Mount of Olives to pray. This was his daily rhythm, teaching in the temple, prayer. And people showed up every day to hear Jesus teach. And a lot of times, the same people. So they're getting this, like, consistent input from Jesus' wisdom into their life. And the religious leaders are there, and they're getting frustrated with Jesus. In fact, in Luke chapter 20, it's full of them asking questions to try to trap Jesus so they could arrest him. At one point, they send in some spies, you know, so it don't look like one of us. And, hey, ask these questions to Jesus to trap him. And Jesus is aware of their stupid little plan. And so, like, in fact, those spies are like, man, this guy really is smart. Like, they're kind of won over to Jesus in this moment. And then in Luke chapter 20, verse 46, Jesus addresses what's happening. He says, beware of these teachers of religious law. For they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. He goes, look, beware of these people. They're in it for themselves. 
They want everybody's eye. They want everybody's attention. They want these long robes and they want the seats of honor at parties and they want the seat of honor in the synagogue, right? There was these, the way the seating system was set up, you had special seats for special people. We call that the front row here and nobody shows up on the front row. But like it's, except you guys, good job, you know. And they go, they just want that. They want the attention. And then he goes a step further in an even more like punishing way. He says this in verse 47, yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be severely punished. He goes, look, not only do they just try to get all the attention and put all the attention on themselves, but they're actually taking advantage of the disadvantaged. Like what? There's a severe punishment for a person like that that takes and looks at disadvantaged people, a widow who's lost her income and is struggling to get by, and you actually take advantage of that person? Like, look out, that's a bad deal. So Jesus addresses this, and then in the next chapter, which it's not, you know, again, I don't always love chapter breakdowns because there's just this regular rhythm. Jesus sees a teaching moment to address that issue we just talked about. People wanting honor, people wanting to be recognized, people taking advantage of the disadvantage. Jesus sees a teaching moment that talks about money, but it's not about money, is it, right? In chapter 21, verse one, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. Okay, now, what would happen is there would be these uh, boxes and there would be a row of them. And the first box was like, this is what everybody gives, like <clears throat> this tie, this regular thing. And then there'd be a box for this special offering. There'd be a box for this special offering. There'd be a box for this special offering. The, the more you went down the line and put money in usually was a symbol of like the more wealthy you are. Right? And so people would walk down this line and put little money in this box, little money in this box, little money in this box. This poor widow enters the room. Remember, these people who are disadvantaged or taken advantage of, one of them walks in and puts two little coins in the box. And he says this, I tell you the truth. He's like, stop, let's talk about this for a second. This poor widow has given more than all of the rest of them. Now, is that true? Did she give more than the rest of them? We would say, no, she didn't. But Jesus goes, actually, she did, because it's not about the amount. Because they've only given a tiny part of their surplus. Now, their tiny part of a surplus may be 50 times more than this poor woman gave, but that wasn't the point. They've given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Like she said, I might not eat this week. Here's what I have. I'm not going to be able to take care of myself this week, but here's what I have. And Jesus stops to go, that's more valuable than what everyone else sees as more valuable. So do we, do we kind of see, right, the heart of Jesus in this? is not like Jesus doesn't need this poor woman's two coins, but he knows I have her heart and I will provide and I will take care of her because she has sacrificed and she has given everything she has. But like these other people giving, it doesn't affect them at all. It's just like a little bit of some extra money they have sitting aside. And yeah, it's, it's more in the economic system, but it's not more in Jesus' economy. And if we're going to pick an economy to live by, which economy do we want to live by? Our culture's economy or the economy of the kingdom of heaven? She is choosing the better thing. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we, uh, Paul uses this beautiful little church to demonstrate a proper attitude towards giving. Now, I, one thing I love about Paul is he's really good about making them feel guilty, but saying, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Parents, we do this all the time, don't we? Like, hey, look, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but like, whatever. I, I wouldn't do that, but whatever. You know, and, and this is, Paul does this. He's like, hey, you know, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but this church, you know, he's, he's kind of playing that game a little bit. He says this in 2 Corinthians 8.1. 
Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They're being tested by many troubles. They're very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. He goes, there's these churches in Macedonia. What would happen is Paul was a missionary, right? And so he was a part of establishing churches. He was a part of growing leaders in churches. He had like a a ministry teams that he would work with to do this. And so there were these churches in Macedonia. One thing that all these churches did is they would kind of network together. If the church in Jerusalem was struggling, churches in Macedonia would go, hey, we'll send some resources to them to help them out. And the church in Jerusalem might see his need and go, well, hey, we we need to pitch in more right now to help these churches over here. And so there was this, they they were separated by borders, but they were connected by their resources and their care for each other. And and so Paul is saying, look, these people, these churches in Macedonia, they've got a ton of trouble right now. And they're very poor, not just a little poor. They're very poor. But yet they have this abundant joy that actually produces this rich generosity in their lives. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford but far more. And they did it of their own free will. He goes, I didn't even have to ask them. In fact, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They heard about what was happening in Jerusalem and they're begging him, please let us be a part of this. I know we're poor, but let us be a part. Let us be a part. We want to help. Because there was just this joy in their lives for what God had done in them and they just wanted to be a part of helping. Verse five says they even did more than we had hoped. Like we didn't expect this from them. For their first action, now understand this, the abundant joy comes from this first action. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us. Just as God wanted them to do. He says their first action was to give their hearts, to give their lives, to give themselves to God. And they were obedient to God because that's what God wanted them to do. And that obedience produced this incredible joy, even though they were facing all kinds of troubles, even though they were very poor. And even in their poorness, they were generous. That seems so backwards, doesn't it? (laughs) That, That is so against the grain in culture. But this is what the people of God do. Individually and collectively, our offerings, our generosity can make an impact that can change the world. And I know we think so big when we think change the world. Let me give you a a smaller example that we can wrap our minds around. Uh, Last week, uh, I was able to go to middle school camp. And I know you're like, bro, you are too old. And I feel it. I'm still like getting naps, right? And we had a few leaders that gave up a week of their life to go and just to hang out with middle schoolers. And it was a blast. It really was a blast. But here, here's the point. Because of all of you, and people in first service, we'll give them some credit too. Because of all of you, students were able to go to camp at hardly no cost to them. No cost to them. And here's what happened there, okay? We had a lot of fun. We did a lot of stupid things you do at camp with middle schoolers, right? There was gross stuff. There was high energy stuff. There was screaming. There was dancing. There was running. Are you tired just thinking about this too, right? Like all the things. But then twice a day, at least twice a day, they would sit and our theme for the week was Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me into pastures and by still waters. Even though I walk through dark valleys, he is with me. Look, students today have so much pressure to achieve, to be the best at everything. And you got to do this, and you got to be here, and you got to sign up for that, and you can't, you can't miss this, and you got to do this, and you got to start this early, and you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. It's exhausting. We didn't have that. They were like, you got to see in math? Cool. You can go ahead and go to college. <laughs> like, that was what it was. And now it's like, no, you got to do this, do this, do this. And listen, I'm all for high achieving. But also, students, the earlier they can learn to find rest in their shepherd, their life is going to be so much better for that. And because of people's contributions, generosity, students got to experience that. Like, when we think change the world, let's not think change the globe, let's think change the world of a seventh grader. 
change the world of someone in our community. And there's this like domino effect. Who knows what will happen in the life of that seventh grader, eighth grader, ninth grader as they grow and as they become a kingdom worker and they make a kingdom impact. This is what generosity does. This is how it changes worlds. But here's some statistics. We love statistics, don't we? U.S. Christians collectively, U.S. Christians, make $5.2 trillion annually. Okay, so the Christians in the United States who claim to be Christians make $5.2 trillion. That makes up half of the world's Christians' income. So you have U.S. Christians making half of all the money amongst Christians in the world. The average giving amount per churchgoer is $17 a week, which roughly adds up to about $884 a year. Now, again, I'm, I'm not trying to pull a Paul thing where I'm going like, hey, I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. Okay? <laughs> but there's just a reality. I read a statistic that the average person, the average Christian, in fact, 43% of Christians say they don't even know what the term tithe means. That's not their fault. That's because the church doesn't talk about money. How are people supposed to know things if we don't talk about it? So I've I've done this illustration before. This is not original with me, okay? But I've done this before. And if you know me, you know that I hate ladders with every ounce of my being. Um, I did this first service, got really uncomfortable. I'm going to get really uncomfortable again, okay? So one, our mission here is to help people find hope one step at a time. That's what we do. Help people find hope one step at a time. We don't need you to take 20 steps. All of us collectively are just, what is my next step in faith? What is God leading me to do next? Let me be obedient to that. All right? And we apply that to everything. We apply, apply that to scripture reading. We apply it to prayer. We apply it to fasting. Uh, we, we apply it to community. We apply it to giving. That's what we do. All right? So there's kind of some different places. Now, this isn't like a ranking system, okay? Like we're not trying to do the religious leader thing. This is just an identifier for where I might be in my life. So the first, the first step, we're going to start it here, is none or occasional. All right, none are occasional. 25% of churchgoers give nothing. Again, if, if you're here and you're like visiting, this is like one of those family conversations that you just get to hear and be a part of. You ever do that as a kid? You go to a friend's house and your friend gets in trouble and you get to be there to watch. It's pretty great that it's not you, isn't it? You're like, oh man, he's really getting it. Like, I'm glad. Like, you're just sitting off to the side. It's really uncomfortable that you have to be a part of that. But you're also glad it's not you, all right? So, like, if you're visiting, listen, this is kind of a family conversation, right, for people who are like, I, I am like a part of this faith community. 25% of regular churchgoers don't give anything, nothing. 37% give occasionally, all right? So that means 62% of people who go, I go to church regularly, either give nothing or every once in a while will give something, all right? It's more sporadic. It's, I got a little extra money. So that's kind of like this first, first place. Then we go to consistent. I give consistently, but never a consistent amount. So there's a regularity, which is a great step. Like anything we do consistently means one, it's important to us. Like if you work out regularly, it means your health is important to you. If you spend time regularly, consistently in prayer, it means it's important to you. And anything we do consistently will change us, whether it's good things we do consistently or bad things we do consistently, right? Like, I eat consistently. Not good for me, right? I can't work out consistently enough to outweigh the eating consistently. That doesn't work. Trust me, I've tried for decades, okay? So giving consistently is a huge step. 8% gives something consistently, All right, then we go, next one is percentage. 9% of people set aside a percentage of their income, right? 5% to 9%. That's what I mean by a percentage of their income. So whatever I make, 5% of it, automatically, I'm just choosing to give this away. And what this does is it creates, um, again, we talked about last week, it recalibrates things for us. It's going, God, I'm gonna trust you that I don't need all of this, I'm trusting you to take care of my needs, to meet my needs, 
okay? So 9% of people give a percentage. Of people who say, I go to church, 9% of people. All right, then we go to the tithe. This is where I start to get a little more uncomfortable. The stage is already like three to four feet higher. This feels really high for me, okay? I don't like this. Uh, 21% of people who go to church give a tithe. Tithe meaning 10%. That's all that means, 10%. Like I'm taking 10% of my income and I'm setting it aside and I'm going, God, this is yours, my first 10%. You know, in old church terms, it was always, that's the first check I write, whatever. Now so much of it is automated. You know, we give online. It just comes out. I get an alert every Sunday that says blah, 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 right? So 21% give a tithe or more. Um, so the interesting thing with this, again, 43% don't even know what that term means, but 21% do. This begins to get a little uncomfortable in life because, like, it's not a little amount of money. Look, even if you're, even if you're 14, you have a summer job, and you're giving 10%, you're like, man, that's kind of a big deal. And it is constantly allowing us to go, like, where is my heart? Do I feel super attached to that? The fact that like, I can say something like, hey, we all should probably volunteer more, and everyone goes, yeah, we probably should. But if I go, we all should probably give 10% of our income away, you're like, well, dude, who are you to tell me I spend my money? The fact that we feel that way means money's a big deal to us. It just does. It's an indicator. So then we get to the extravagant, all right? So of that 21%, that's actually people who tithe and people who give even beyond that. So that goes to the next step. <clears throat> it's weird. I'm not afraid of heights. I'm afraid of falling. falling. <laughs> like I can sit in a tree stand all day, not a problem. I can stand on top of a roof, not a problem. Up here, it's a problem, all right? This is, I give well beyond 10%. Like, I have structured my life and my finances in a way to where, like, I'm just giving stuff away. I'm blessing people. I'm meeting needs. And guess what? It's really uncomfortable. Because every once in a while, you would be like, yeah, but I earned that money. That's my money. Remember that commercial? It's my money, and I want it now. <laughs> J.G. Wentworth, 177 cash now. That's weird I remember that. <clears throat> Interesting statistic here. 77% of people who tithe end up giving more than 10%. You know why that is? Because once they practice that, they go, wow, this is friggin' amazing. There's so much joy in this. How can I give more? How can I bless the community? How can I send kids to camp? How can, like, how can I help? And again, we're not having this conversation because God wants something from you. It's what he wants for you. And I know that sounds like church speak, but I promise you it's so true. But this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. For me. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. I feel bad for these people, the view they're getting at the moment. Like, you all got the good side, okay? Last service, that side got the bad side. It's just uncomfortable. I, I don't know about you. I want to live my life a little uncomfortable. Like, if we're seeking comfort constantly, man, we're just not really living out the mission that he has for us. Let me give you a story. In uh, Luke, Jesus is doing this ministry tour, right? He's going around preaching the gospel. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. Right, he's on this gospel tour. He took his 12 disciples with him, <clears throat> along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them, and he's going to name a few, among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. The Bible makes it a point, Luke makes it a point in his gospel to identify a group of women, even the many others that he uses there, and the language is the female gender. He goes, there was a group of women who funded Jesus' gospel tour. 
Mary, who had been healed and of demon possession, casts out seven demons. And she's so overwhelmed and thankful that she just spends her time with Jesus and she finds ways to use her resources so other people can experience what she experienced. Then you have Joanna and her husband, Chusa, who are elites, right? The business manager for Herod. And they risk things to go like, we want to we wanna support and we want to fund what Jesus is doing. Susanna, her name is listed probably because she was kind of like a Joanna. She probably a little upper, you know, upper echelon in the financial world and probably had a little more to lose. But she supports Jesus. And many other women find ways to use their resources to support this gospel tour. One, it, we can show our gratitude for how Jesus healed us through our generosity. Two, we can use the resources we've been given to continue the work of Jesus. And three, we can use our giving as a way to just stay close to Jesus. And there's story after story after story from the time Jesus walked the earth and was preaching the good news and the kingdom of God to this day. Names you don't even know. They're behind the scenes people, but they are funding gospel work because they've experienced the gospel. So I wanna end with another video. And this video doesn't really have to do with money because again, money's not the thing. It's our heart and our attitude. It's this spirit of generosity. And so I wanna just share this story because it's such a generous thing. All right, check it out. My favorite quote of all time was our furnace repair man comes into the house, stops dead in his tracks, and says, this looks like some kind of United Nations meeting. I was born in Bangkok. Bangalore, India. Connecticut. And I was born in Romania. Ethiopia. Which is in Africa. In China. <laughs> Sharon is the gas pedal, and I am the brakes. Over and over she'll say, I found this child who needs X and Y and Z, and all we'd have to do is fly over the ocean, get funding, connect this dot to here, and it'd be done. We're such victims of our culture because our culture tells us your kids have to look perfect and be in all the perfect schools, and you can't do that with a big family, but if you just concentrate on what's important, the rest will follow. People discouraged us. They thought we were gonna ruin our lives by taking all these special kids and they said, you don't know what to do. And it's true that we had no experience and we didn't really know how to raise them, but you, you see what happens with unconditional love. You give a person unconditional love and they, they blossom. I feel like having these kids has really helped us find our life, find our meaning, find our purpose. It took me decades to figure this out, but there's no physical thing that you can buy that's actually going to give you true peace and happiness. And the pure joy that will come from a, a rescue and a ransom of a child's life is probably the most satisfying thing you can imagine. We talk about adoption. We tell them they're adopted and we kind of tell them, you know, being born into a family, you don't even decide that. It kind of happens biologically, but when you're adopted, your parents looked out at the whole world and picked you. You think that they don't really know the gravity of them being rescued or saved. Then you'll see them in an external setting, like 
One of them is in front of 300 people last Friday night, and he tells people that he probably wouldn't be alive if he hadn't been adopted by his family. Those are the, like the goosebump moments when you go, he's got it. at the time when I was born, um, when, you were, when you were born with a, a deformity, quote, quote, it, um, it was considered a curse by God. I was um, kind of distanced and not treated right and kind of not really getting any care that a, a normal baby should, which is why when I was one and a half years old, I weighed nine pounds. It was rough in the, in the first year of my life, but I lived. But no matter where you were before, it's like where you can be now, your past doesn't define that. And this family has proven that. And it's just like you have a dying boy from Romania or starving kids from Africa, and you bring them to a, a place where they can be, I guess, human to the fullest, and that, that's, that's a generous generous thing. Family is everything. Family's fun. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> His family is just people you can be a fool around and they'll still love you. Awesome. No, should I do the Dennehy face? Family is something that I can count on. Family is adoption. What an amazing picture of God's generosity, God's provision for the least of these. Can we stand and let's sing again this morning? i
generosity and the mercy that was shown to us in that moment, Father, we thank you. God, you are so great and so holy and so worthy of all of our praise this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us this morning. We love you all. We'll see you next Sunday.